sending out frequencies underneath the streets of Cincinnati. It's WTBS, the basement show after dark with Lee Zellers. Well, welcome back to the basement show after dark with your host, Lee Zellers. And I'm just sitting here checking out some stuff online. Uh, there's a story here, kind of interesting of uh, Sir Patrick Stewart. Hmm, I know he was a sir now. Patrick Stewart, you remember him, played Captain Pritchard on Star Trek. The guy is like 73, and he's about to marry a young lady who I believe is 35. And they got this picture of him, like, in this thing of these plastic, like, these plastic colorful balls that you find like at Chuck E. Cheese, they're both buried in it. And he got a smile and she got a smile. But Patrick's smile, he got one of those kind of smiles of a person who might have been hitting a little chiba. I think he does that though. I think Patrick is hitting a little chiba. But, you know, hey, he's a 73 year old guy. Looks like he's in pretty good shape. Got him a wife of age 35, and I hope that works out for him. Um, I'm going to read this little bit about some of our global issues, and the biggest one, I guess, is Syria. This is out of the uh, USA Today. Syria looms large at G20 leaders meeting. Obama to talk today with China and France. President Obama renewed efforts Thursday to persuade global allies to back military strike on Syria over the use of chemical weapons. Attending a group of 20 summit in the Russian, otherwise devoted to the global economy, Obama said before meeting with Japanese Prime Minister that he looked forward to an extensive conversation about Syria. Hmm. The White House said Obama has also spoken with U.S. senators from both parties during his three-day trip to Sweden and Russia, seeking domestic support as Congress consider a resolution authorizing force against Bashar Assad government. I know a lot of us feel, well, a lot of people just straight out feel that uh, there should be no strike or the U.S. should not get involved because the Middle East has just got us all kind of freaked out because of the war that took place with Iraq and what's going on in Afghanistan. We still got troops there. But I'm just kind of wondering about the whole, you know, what Bashar government did as far as gassing um, his his people, um, the citizens of Syria. And I, I, from my understanding, there is a law that all of the nations are to follow that we're not to use chemical weapons. And I'm guessing if that's some type of law that we all agree to, that when someone do it, there should be some kind of repercussion. Um, Obama obviously feel the repercussions should be to go in there with a military strike. Um, I know that I spoke with people about this and they said, well, there were some issues that took place in other countries where dictators were killing their own civilians and it might not have been chemical, but the U.S. didn't always get involved in Africa. But in this situation, they want to go in and uh, drop bombs. And I think a big part of it, though, is just the mere fact that they were not supposed to use chemical weapons. Chemical weapons should not be used, I think, in any military confrontation. So I think that's the issue. You might ask where I stand. He, something needs to happen. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I don't know what the repercussions will be if the U.S. decides to go in there and drop bombs, but anytime you drop bombs on anyone, it's painful. In local news, we got a lot of stuff that's always happening within our own community. 
it's kind of sad because of the, the, the crime, it, it just seemed like these shootings and murders in our, our city of Cincinnati just never stops. OTR shooting victim had turned his life around. Ambrose Foster died outside of a renovated store. Says that the over the Rhine Ambrose Foster 39 shot and killed at 1600 Ray Street Monday night had a long criminal record. But had turned his life around in the past years, his family says. He died on the streets outside of the building that he had been building. Because, had, wait a minute, let me maybe put this down and kind of focus clearly on that and not on the drink. He died on the street outside the building that had become his redemption in the past three months. Now I can pick this up and I think I can handle it now. We're okay now. A handyman good with remodeling drywall and woodwork, Foster had almost single-handedly renovated the corner commercial space at Liberty and Ray Street. His niece, Ashley Foster, and her business partner, Makita Woods, both 20, 24, will open their women's store, women's shoe store, Saturday. And they said, here, we don't want to let him down, Ashley said. We have to open. Police don't have a suspect in the slaying which remains under investigation. Family members don't know what happened either. The reporter, the report says he died in the gutter. But I don't want this to be his legacy, said one sister, Gina Baker of, uh, of the West End. He had a troubled past, but he had changed. And it's good to hear that, you know, because none of us is perfect. Like they said, the old saying, he without sin, cast the first stone and there's not nobody out there throwing any rocks. But um, this this senseless murder that's taking place in our city, I just wish it would stop. Here's another story. Uh, city worker put on unpaid leave after theft arrest. Reading this out of our local inquirer. A city employee has been placed on unpaid leave after he was accused of stealing more than $7,000 in coins. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't carry that all around in his pocket. But if he was dumb enough to steal, maybe he was dumb enough to carry it around in his pocket. Mark, I think his name is Kosmeyer, Korsmeyer. 55 of Loveland was arranged Wednesday in Hamilton County Municipal Court on charge of theft in office. Korsmeyer is a cashier, and I'm pretty sure I'm jacking his name up, is a cashier in the Treasury Division. The city website listed him as involved with parking meter collection. So this guy is going around collecting money from the parking meter instead of dropping it down in whatever container he pulls to take back to, I guess, the office or wherever it is his, he works from, he probably was dumping it in his pocket. City manager Milt Dahoney Jr. sent a memo to Mayor Mark Mallory and council alerting them to the arrest. The memo said, Korsmeyer began his career with the city in May 1980. I think I pronounced his name like differently two or three times. Uh, and has worked with the Treasury Division for more than 30 years. Hmm. 30 years? Maybe that's why he was put on unpaid leave after getting busted for $7,000. I've known people who have gotten fired for eating a piece of candy. And <laughs> they was not put on unpaid leave. Anyway, got a great show today. I got uh, coming up. I'm gonna clear all of my stuff away and get rid of my jack. Get all this stuff off the table. I get rid of this like this. Ah, oh, that's nice. We got Ashton L. Wilson, who will be coming on the show. Motivational speaker, uh, very deep young man who does a lot in the community and helping getting young people and trying to help keep them on the straight and narrow. He speaks at a lot of different um, um, 
community centers and, and churches and, and things of this nature to, like I said, to motivate young people and help get them their minds off of negative stuff and try to get them focused on positive things. So, like I said, when we be back, when we come back, we will have my guest, Ashton L. Like I said, I'm going to get a lot of this stuff out the way so I can sit here and speak with Mr. Ashton concerning what it is he does in the city of Cincinnati. So, stay tuned. Well, I'm sitting here with my guest, Ashton L. What's up, Ashton? What's happening? Good to have you back because we did something once before, but that was a little, a little while back and kind of a different show. Yeah. So, uh, what's been happening since then? Oh, man. Well, I'm continuing to speak, motivational speaking. Um, I'm in the works of getting with a group of friends to start a, a ministry, uh, just an intentional community. Uh, and, you know, we don't have a specific neighborhood yet, uh, but we want to move in there and really help out and, and change some things. Um, have a talk show called Real Raw and Relevant, internet oh. TV talk show. Um, so we do that every Saturday at 1 okay. on sbnstudio.com. Um, and just enjoying life. Picked up cycling. and That's what I want to do. Yeah. I ain't done that since my early youth. Well, my father, they have a bike club. Uh, it's called the Major Taylor Club. Okay. Uh, Major Taylor was a guy who actually was the first black to win a whole bunch of different races, the okay. Olympics, that type of thing. And a lot of people don't know who he is, but his name was Major Taylor. Okay. Uh, and so they have their own little club, guys from Dayton, and uh, men and women in Cincinnati. So they all you know are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, but they be pushing it, man, 100 miles. Oh, well. Big time miles. Yeah. <laughs> I might have to reconsider that then. <laughs> people start out, you know, at the oh, beginning of the season, people start out like 25, 30. Right. Mm. So, yeah, we, and when we talked before, and we was kind of talking about this off camera, just about the youth and seeing what you're trying to do. Um, sometimes, man, it's just like, you know, we can't give up on them. But, and the but is, our youth today is like, and I guess every generation will look back and say, or they look at the generation that's coming up under them. Probably, you know, I'm pretty sure my parents did the same thing. And you know, they, you crazy young people, you know, mm -hmm. they seem more crazier today than ever. Because we was talking off camera, and I was telling you about a couple that I saw who was like tatted up from head to toe, and they like they was probably 18. I mean, they got. The test, it was on their face. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you explain to somebody, like, you know what? You might not want to do that. Because somewhere you might want to be able to have a serious job. Uh, unless you rapper, hip-hop, Lil Wayne can get away with it. But everybody can't do mm -hmm. that. And it's, 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 it's like, how do you kind of get them to, like, not see that you can't emulate the hip hop culture all the way. Yeah. Everything that they do, you can't do because you gotta live in a real world and you're gonna have responsibilities and mean you're gonna need a job, take care of your family and all of that stuff you just did to your face probably gonna prevent that. So it's it makes it a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think a, a, the biggest deal is uh, we got a lot of followers and even some other people, like you said, Lil Wayne and them, they can, that are considered leaders, they're really still followers. Right. Because, I mean, you could trace his, where he started. At one point it was strictly like, I'm hood, blah, blah, blah. Now it's then trans, uh, progressed to where he getting piercings and, you know, little rock and roll type feel and skateboarding and that, that different thing. So. I mean, the, all of them is go with the culture. Right. What's what's good? What type of genre is good? And 
what these kids don't realize that ideas are powerful and, and once they come in you can't stop it ideas don't ask permission right. they just come in and uh, the longer you dwell on that you know the, it becomes uh, prevalent in your life you know? so how did you reach this point you know because I'm just guessing, yeah. you know, you could have been one of those, like I said, when I was coming up, the way your parents was kind of like, you know, keeping you on a focus on your religious belief and keeping you in church and that type of thing. Or sometimes it happens where things happen in our life yeah. that brings us here. Yeah. So was it, was it that you was always there or was there a turning point that oh, brought you man. to this? So... The interesting thing is, <laughs> uh, my girlfriend and I, we went to, a, it's, it's an intentional community. I had about 30 people there. Uh, they they trying to live out how it was an act, you know, where people come together, they do life together. So last night, uh, we broke up in groups and we worked on telling our story as an evangelist, uh, evangelistic tool. Mm -hmm. Our stories is really powerful in, in the story. So it's funny you ask me that because... I just worked on my story and tuning it up yesterday to be very powerful in how I deliver it. Right. Um, so it kind of, this is how I say it. it. It started with me as a young man who who had two parents who I definitely believe cared for me. And they, they wanted to get me out of the hood. They wanted to put me in a, a, a suburbia to, to maybe better my chances in life, mm -hmm. for, you know, for their own beliefs, I don't, you know what, know why? Maybe it was good for my good, maybe it was for my bad. I don't know, but I remember around kindergarten. You know, you play house in kindergarten, and you do those type of things, and and there came a point when my father was like, "You can't do that no more. You can't play house, man. That's that's not. It. They may be a little gay. Like there were certain things as it, you know, some young boy, right. you better stop crying right, so right, much." Right. Um, so I remember, Man up type yeah. Right. So I remember at a time when I was about six, uh, I ran outside. I ran inside because my neighbor took my boss crying like that. He took my stuff. My dad whooped me. And he said, "If you ever come in here telling me somebody took your stuff, like you just did, I'm gonna whoop you again." So he made me, forced me to go back out there and really pursue this kid in right. a physical way to get my stuff back. And I just look on back on that and how it birthed anger. So I look like over my life, like why well, was I always a fighter? And it was that moment that seed was planted. Instead of teaching me a godly way uh, to say, uh, and this is how a lot of boys in the inner city are raised. Right. Yeah. That's they're, how I was raised. Yeah, they're raised like that. But what happens is when they get older, we don't understand the critical thinking model, the conflict resolution. Right. So when we get to corporate America, we don't understand conflict resolution. Right. We say, are oh, you disrespecting right. me? So I'm either responding physically or right. emotionally right. instead of being able to use this to, right. to, really, to really, you know, uh, fight our battles for us. So, you know, through sports, you know, you get to elementary, you're always in sports. You're always busy, busy, busy. Right. Um, in sports, they teach you on the field. You better not cry if you get ran over. You better if you break a, a finger, you better suck it up. Like, right. and so from six to about college level, you know, you get to this place where you're in school, and by college, man, it was sports, school, and girls. That's it. You know, right. so from six in the morning to you know late at night is 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 you know early morning weights, school, work right. study. Practice, then maybe have a girl over, you know, and ha hang out. So it, it's like that. But after you get out of school, your your life slows down because right. you don't have college, you don't have that environment no more. So it's like you, I felt empty. And then you know, I grew up in the church. My mom and them didn't really force me, but they took me. Right. And sometimes they, you know, would ask me like, "Hey, you should, you maybe you should go to church this week. You been, haven't been in a month or two. Right. And um, when I got to the church, I started, when I really wanted to start getting my life, I went to the apostolic church. <laughs> I've never been. I, I kind of, I was at a black church, a mixed church, so I seen a little different variety. Mm -hmm. um, but when I got to apostolic church, you know, it was a, it was very on a, a different level. But I liked, I liked the teaching, 
And but when I got there, they said, Ashley, you need to settle down. You know what I'm saying? You need to find a wife, right. man. You need to show emotion. But they didn't realize that from six to 20, 23, my emotions were stripped. Right. It was th now you expect me to show this girl uh, emotion, and then and, and over so over over the years, this this quest to you know, I found out that my my father cheated and. And I was raised around certain men who had all these different women, man. It's like, I'm, man, I, I think one of the defining moments in my life when I found that out, mm -hmm. when it was like, it was like almost a movie. I was in a movie and mm -hmm. it hit home. Mm -hmm. Then I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be like him. So God really started, uh, that's not, that's this one point. Right? Right. I know we don't have time to talk about all of them, but there's this one point in my life where I said, you know, there has to be a change. Cause I, 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 God showed me that it was a generational thing. Right. My, my real grandfather, who is Caucasian, I've never met. He cheated with my African American grandmother on his wife. Right. So I have a whole side of the family that don't even know I exist. Right. You That's know what I'm saying? Deep, you know? Yeah. And so that was generational. Mm -hmm. Then my step grandfather that married my grandfather, he left her for another one. You see what I'm saying? And so that's that side of the family. Then on my mom's side of the family, uh, it was a, a, a similar situation where it wasn't like adultery or anything, but uh, they never got married. Had my mom at a well, like my grandma already had, you know, a husband and kids before that. And, and my mom got, she's the only one from my, that, that, uh, that relationship, but she has, you know, half brothers on both sides and half sisters on both sides. Mm -hmm. So. On both sides, there is a gen there was a generational curse that uh, I I got over my eyes to, and I said, you know what, I can't be like this. Yeah. <laughs> I refuse to be like this because I, I don't want to have my kids experience that same pain, man. Because I mean, that night, man, I was ready when I found out. I I didn't know. My whole family, my brother knew. Mm -hmm. People knew. Mm -hmm. I had to find out on the hiccup. I found right. the little picture like, who the who the heck is this? Right. My brother, oh I'll snap! <laughs> like I, had, I, I, I I remember sitting in the living room like this, man, with a gun in my lap. Like I'm gonna kill him. Wow. I'm gonna kill him. Tears in my eyes. And the crazy thing, I had a chick over the house when I found out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'm looking at her like, man, you gonna have to go. Like, I don't even like you. Like, I was just you this little honey dip. I was about to have a kind of the crib. Like, and my brother there, I remember she was there, and um, my coach called me, and he was like, yo, why are you crying, dude? Like, he like, you need to come back. And I told him what happened. He like, bro, you gonna throw your scholarship away, your life yeah. for a mistake? I right. mean, I mean, it was a mistake, but that's their lives. You know, right. you gotta get over this, man. Right. Right? Like you gonna throw your life in, in jail away because you, you upset that man. This happened to everybody on my right. like, yeah. Oh yeah, this happened to many men. Right. You know, many young men that suffered this, young women, but that don't define your life either. Like, and over the years, I realized that I am my father's child, but I'm not his choices. Right. I just I know God let let me. Sit. It I think all that that added up to. You know, early fights, man. I remember back to 13. With him birthing that in it, he, I don't think he still today realized why I was such an angry kid. Right. Kind of 13, 15, and 17, we got in three physical fights, man. Like, one, the first time, 13, on the phone, he tell me, keep telling me get off. Finally, he hung up on this girl <laughs> that I was on the phone with. I, I cursed him out, man. He threw me down the steps and then slammed my face and I'm bloody and... You know, I stayed outside in the woods for, you know, probably about six, seven hours. They looking for me, calling the police, like, uh, but looking back on my life, man, I, I see how that anger was birthed in me at six and why I'm so physically aggressive and this type of thing. Like, it was birthed from you, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? You taught me this. Yeah. You know, and so over the years, I've had to learn, um, you know, how to use conflict resolution. I think God started, when I started, his, his, his word, his law, it shows you the ugliness about yourself. So like Paul said, I didn't know coveting was bad until your law showed it to me. Right. I didn't know uh, anger and these type of things was so ugly until you sh showed it. And uh, one and another defining life, a part of my life was uh, 
when I got in a fight and, and I, I hit this guy and he hit his head on one of his parking blocks. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I was angry, but I looked down, this dude motionless. His eyes in the back of the head. Right. He, he's shaking to where he's not moving. So it went to anger to like, wake up, dude. Right. Wake up, bro. Right, right. Because at that moment, I knew like, yo, my life Thing could is be gone. Right. If he's dead. Right. And, 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 and when, even when he was knocked out, I'm still on top of him. And my, my dude pulled me off. And I really, I pushed him like, what you doing, bro? He's like, bro, he's not moving. You better chill out. Right. And um, I, I told myself, like, look. God, if you wait to do that, I'll never fight again, bro. Like, just wake him up, please. Right, right. And uh, the guy finally came out of it. He wanted to fight me. Like, come on, bro. I'm like, nah, bro. We, we good, man. Like, I have nothing else to prove to you. I'm just glad you all right. Like, and uh, I may have gotten like three or four fights since then. But that was dealing on the basketball court. But, you know, overall, uh, I, I really had to start choosing to, to do things differently. Right. And, Allowing God to help me in those weak areas, so. I, it takes, you know, like, you have, some, see, everybody, they they get those calls, but they don't always wake up from them. Yeah. You know, like, the experience you was explaining. It's one of those moments where you get the call that you know, either I keep going in this direction, and it's going to turn out ugly. And that's what the call is telling you, or, it's the or, yeah. or you can go and, and do this. And, and change the course of where your life going because the alternative is is right there for you to see it. You can see that yeah. it's not. It don't look good. Yeah, man. So this quote, I like this quote you got where it says, uh, "Love is like a butterfly. If you hold it too tight, it would die. If you hold it too loose, it'll fly away." Mm -hmm. right, what made you come up? How did you come up with that quote? What is it about that quote that you? I feel like. There are a lot of people go into relationships thinking their relationship is going to last on love. Now in the Greek you'll, you'll see there's four types of love. There's eros that deals with sexual love. You have phileo dealing with brotherly love like the city, city of Philadelphia is city of brotherly love. Right, that's right. where they get that right. phileo. And then you have storge, that's the uh, relationship to like family, brothers, uh, husband, or mother to daughter, then you have agape, and that's God-given, that's unconditional, sacrificial, and why is it God-given? I believe it's a gift, because Christ, he freely gave himself up, even though he, I mean, he knew he was sitting next to Judas. Right. He said, he knew what Peter was going to do. He right. said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times, and Peter was his right-hand dude, man, like, right. Peter was the first to follow him, Peter was like, you know, I'm cutting off this, like, Right. Like, he was the one who was like, the other 11 disciples were scared. He was like, I'm stepping yeah. out on this boat. Right. Like, what's good? Right. Like, Peter was, a, was one of them boy. type of yeah. guy. Was, like, right. he was like, yo, I, I, you know, he was a go-getter. And um, with love, sometimes we, we start to experience love and say, I love this girl. But it starts turning. It may start off as like, right, but it turns into jealousy. So you can start squeezing that butterfly too tight you can squeeze mm -hmm. her too tight you can start saying you can't go out with your friends you can't do this you can't do that so that one's love you, you starts but if, if 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 it's too free like yeah I, if like the old saying if you the do the keep the things you do to get your baby hooked are the things you got to do to keep your baby right, hooked right. so if you go in a relationship you got her hooked and all of a sudden you just lay back and you kicking and you playing the video game you you you're not showing her the, the right. attention then you holding her too loosely and she may say, you know what, you don't really love me because at the end of the day, love boils down to, to I sh like sometimes in a relationship I get frustrated when a woman wants to hear me say I love you all the time. Like I should never have to say it one time because you can see it in my actions. Right. I'm so being, why am yes. I just, because everybody I, say I, I love I, you. Go ahead. Tell me love about that. That, that. that right there. Yeah. That right there, man. Sometimes, it, it, that, I, I always say that. I could say that 20 times within an hour. Yeah. On the hour. Yeah. It's just a word. Yeah. It's what I do that defines, that defines how much I love you. Yeah. And so that's what I mean by that quote. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot deeper. And I, you know, 
just like uh, yeah, like we said, man. I, I really, you know, cause I used to, man, to get girls to sleep with you. You say, what you say? <laughs> I love you. I love you. You don't know how much, man. And I love you. And that's like, oh, and then that's a part of the game. So um, you should know. You should be. You should know, like, man. She loves me, or he loves me, right. man, because he laid out Just, his life right, for me, right, man. He, right. Based he on does this for me, right. he does that right. for me, man. Like he really got my best, or right. she got my best interest, man. She just, she's there for me, right. man. She, she like puts herself, in, you know, maybe tired and still fix me breakfast, or maybe tired but still comes do stuff for me or whatever, like, um, and that's how it should be, man. Christ. Right. You never really hear Christ say, I, I love you to his disciples. Right. I don't even, now that I think about it, I don't yeah, remember him yeah. saying it. Like, because, like, people, like, this dude loved me because he healed me. This right. dude loved me because he 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 he, he prayed for me. Right. He did this for me, man. You, it's the you never see, yeah, you it's never the, see yeah. that Christ saying, I love you. Right. He should have right. to. It was what he did. It's that was, you know, and it's, it's how he ended. Yeah. You know, it was the, the yeah. ultimate love. And that's this. That is so. Well, man, I'm glad to have you come on the show. Uh, where can they reach us? You on Twitter, Facebook? So we have my Real Raw and Relevant. That's what it's called. It's a show. Um, so people can go on Real Raw and Relevant um, on Facebook. If you type in Real Raw and Relevant, there's um, my my personal page was Real Raw and Relevant with Ashton L. Wilson. You can type that in. Or they have the community page, Real Raw and Relevant. Uh, I have a, f a fan page on Facebook, uh, Facebook.com backslash Ashton L. Wilson. You can connect with me that way. Uh, the website, I have AshtonLWilson.com, Twitter.com backslash Ashton L. Wilson. Uh, the Real Raw Relevant Show, instead of uh, we're working on putting like either a DVD together of all the shows mm -hmm. or an audio thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really going to try to you know promote that and sell that because... In a book, I only can share so much, but right. when I talk, like, revelation, like, deeper, like, we talk. Like, I right. never heard Christ say, I love you, like, for real. Yeah. Uh, that just came from this conversation. Right. Like, so when we talk, it's like, the Lord will start moving, and, man, it's like stuff being said. And right. if you got it on tape and in audio, like, people getting the scope of what right. the conversation was versus, you know, trying to concise these ideas into a book. Right. So. Well, I know you a tech guy. Uh, there's a study. It was called FOMO, F O M O, and I, I talk to my girlfriend all the time about it. It's 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 the stands for the fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. That's what you talk like. Like there's no more like. When was a day you sat there all day like, like say you at home watching a football game, you go to commercial. Like we picking up our phone and right. check Facebook or something because in this era. Uh, through the phone and these different things that have created this psychological thing that you you feel you feel like you're missing out right. on something, like so we always check Instagram, right. we always doing that, and I've really tried to like go daily. I'm not checking Instagram, right. Facebook because really, like you driving, you texting, you it's like we always f we feel that void instead of having conversations. Right. And sitting down and communicating with people, that, well, that's why it's missing out. Yeah, I, I sometimes when all of this stuff gets to be too much, I always I think about something that John Lennon said when he said uh, he wish he could have just been a fisherman. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I think like I just wish I could have been a fisherman. Sometimes. Oh just, yeah, you know. I, I think man, that's powerful <laughs> because I've uh, I've sat down and said, man, what if I was born in like, you know, a certain time. <laughs> Where they have all this technology, right. and you just all you had to do is just work and spend time with your family. It gets to be a bit family. much, man. It gets to be. It can be overwhelming. Man. Well, man, I'm glad you came on the show. Ashton reached in the crate and pulled out a classic, classic Evelyn Champagne King. Shame. We're gonna go out with that. Y'all check him out on Facebook. Tune in to Basement Show at the Dark Lee Zone. And I kind of just screwed that up right there. But that's what happens when you're working with an old phonograph and LP and the wax and all People that. People don't know about these. Don't they don't know nothing about that, man. See, you get that little crackle sound. Yeah. It's, you can hear all the drums and all oh, the instruments. Right. And it's, it's just pure music, you know what I mean? It's like, that's when people went in the studio. Yeah.